Hello, welcome to Linux Lads, episode 102. As usual, I'm Shane. This week I'm joined by Amalith and Mike. Say hello, chaps. Hello, chaps. Hello, hello. No Connor this week because he is, uh, I think he's on holidays in the States uh, at the moment. We're also joined by a very special guest. Uh, we're joined by Chris from the Geo Project. How are you, Chris? I am doing well. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Um, it's always great when we get a guest on uh, and we can really like drill down into a certain project. Like It's always very interesting. So I'm going to hand it over to Amalith to uh, start interrogating Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Chris and I have been friends for four years? A while. And you introduced me to Go and to Gio, and it's been a great experience. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? So my name is Chris Walden, and I'm a freelance software engineer. So as my job, people hire me to add features to the GIU open source project, which we're going to talk more about later. And I really enjoy that. I also have three cats, an adorable little daughter, and a lovely wife. All right, never mind all the technical stuff. Tell us about the cats. <laughs> Okay, so I have uh, Edmund the Grey Tabby, uh, his biological sister Mercedes, who's a calico, who's shy and beautiful and a very proper little lady, and then uh, a third orange tabby named Maximilian. They're all named after characters in the Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, I like that. I like themed cat names. So uh, let's get into it, I guess. Can you tell us exactly what, what is Gyo? Sure thing. So first of all, I know it's hard to pronounce. And the reason it's hard to pronounce is it was created by a man named Elias Nauer, who is Danish. And in Danish, these vowels make different sounds than in English. And so I actually can't reliably say it the way that Elias pronounces it. It's something like gyu. But, you know, when I look at the letters G-I-O, that is not what my brain tries to do. So I compromise on something like gyo. But honestly, I don't really think it matters how you pronounce it. Like, that's not that important. So we, we accept Geo and every other variant under the sun. As for what it is, it's a technology that lets you create graphical user interfaces across all major operating systems and platforms using the Go programming language. That's kind of a big deal because Go already has a lot going for it. It's a very portable language. It compiles to native machine code. It bundles all of its dependencies into static executables, so it makes it really easy to redistribute. But it's largely been relegated to sort of the server-side development space because of its lack of graphical capability. And graphics is kind of a, a complex area to get into because there's so many different graphics APIs. There's so many different ways to go about getting pixels on the screen. And uh, doing it efficiently and in a modern way requires using a GPU, right? You can't just make the CPU do all that work because there's just too many pixels now. You have to kind of parallelize things using specialized hardware. But talking to that specialized hardware is complicated and platform dependent, and it's difficult to do something like that in pure any language. You know, like every Python and JavaScript and many other languages also don't natively do that. You know, everyone kind of relies on you know, OpenGL or Vulkan or these other like big APIs for manipulating graphics. What GIU brings to the table is uh, an API that lets you ask the GPU to perform common operations in a way that is really cross-platform. So you can build useful and intricate user interfaces writing pure Go code without writing OpenGL, without writing you know, shader code or worrying about really low-level graphical differences between the platforms. So GIU implements material design widgets uh, kind of in its default state, but that's not really the core capability. That's an example of a thing GIU can do. What GIU is, is more like a virtual machine for drawing graphics efficiently in a cross-platform way using the GPU. That sounds almost like an impossible task because, I mean, on the, on the, on the face of it, how do how does it do it? How it was that like a painstaking developer work for every platform to make sure that uh, how does it even talk to the hardware? So there must be something between uh, between it and and your 
graphics card, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's not like we rebuilt all of graphics from the ground up. We do rely on OpenGL and Vulkan ourselves, as well as DirectX and the, the Apple Metal graphics APIs. But what you did, or what Elias did when he first uh, built this project, was identify a set of common operations that you need to do in order to like draw something useful. So like the most fundamental is draw an outline of something, like logically. Uh, so you, you know, make a rectangle, right? And it's just, there's an operation we call clipping, where you identify a rectangle of the screen and you say, okay, I want to do something with this rectangle. And then there's another operation that like sets the paint material, is what we call it. So you can set the paint material to a color or set the paint material to an image. And then there's a third operation that is apply the current paint material to the current clip region, right? So if it's a rectangle and you set it to a color, we fill that rectangle in with that color. But the clipping region doesn't have to just be like a rectangle. It can be an arbitrary, complex path. And you can get astoundingly far with just those few operations, as well as some to like move and rescale clipping areas. And so what we did, or what Elias did, was build, you know, specialized shaders and uh, rendering infrastructure for doing these simple operations that work across this wide spectrum of backends so that we can talk to the graphics hardware for any given platform. Um, and get pretty consistent results across those platforms. But you, the programmer, you say, okay, I want to make a big, I, I clip a big triangle, and then I set my image to this cat's face picture, and then I say paint, and I get a triangle with part of that cat's face in it, right? So if I, if I understand this correctly, you've got this amazing work where you basically make a common API to any OT uh, or any major platform and hardware combination. And then there are two things that in my short experience with GIU, I, f I came across like as super important. One is the immediate mode on which it operates. I think Amolif went into it in the last episode. Means basically constantly you drawing every frame, everything is drawn again. And second was, and you touched on this, the operation stack. It's like a call stack of a function, if I understand it correctly, where you basically say, okay, I, I want to draw a rectangle, so you add the drawer operation to the stack. So for me, the experience of creating a GUI application was really very, very different from uh, things that I tried in the past. I assume that is kind of common feedback. Uh, do you get that a lot, or is that something that uh, people are actually very well used to, and it is a common paradigm? Um, I think it's unusual for people who are accustomed to working with high level, especially like object oriented retained mode UI, for instance, you know, QT or GTK, where you approach building an interface in terms of constructing discrete widget objects and connecting them together. And you think very little about like how how are the pixels of this widget composed, right? Often that's like defined for you elsewhere and a little bit difficult to go in and manipulate yourself. Gui's paradigm is about building something we call an operation list. And an operation list describes one frame of your application. So when you invoke layout code, you insert operations like clipping a rectangle and setting a paint color and painting it or creating a clip that's the shape of text and then setting a color and painting that and bam, you just display text on the screen. And once you've populated the operation list, you submit it to GIU and GIU runs through its uh, backend for the current platform and its renderer to produce a frame described by that operation list. And so if you're used to kind of low level graphics APIs, I think there are some others that work in a similar way. But it's it's very different from like the the Qt style of building an API. However, we do provide higher level APIs than this, right? Because it's it would be insane to manually do all of this for every widget. So we have a API we call like the widget or the layout API. And when you're working with that, you actually often don't have to worry about operations individually at all. You just say, hey, I want to create a button with this text content. And everything is determined by this idea of constraints, where 
a widget can occupy some amount of space that is like told to it. It has passed its constraints as part of a, a graphics context. And we say, you must occupy at least this much space, and you can occupy up to this much space. And then the widget returns how much of that space it actually used. So most of the time, writing a, a GUI application, you're working in this sort of high-level layout API, but you can easily dive down to the operation API to create custom widgets with your own behaviors. Could you go a bit more in depth on the difference between retained, what people might be more familiar with, and immediate mode, which might be more unfamiliar? Sure thing. I don't think I did a great job describing it last episode. <laughs> so retained and immediate mode are two different ways of thinking about application state. At the end of the day, your application, your, your GUI, has some state. Did Is this checkbox checked? Is this progress bar halfway full, right? Like we have to keep track of that information. But also there's stuff like where is the progress bar and how big is it? And where is where is everything, right? And there's multiple ways we can go about modeling that. So in retained mode, uh, you construct widgets and layouts and you wire them up and the widgets keep track or their, their parent layout keeps track of their size and their position within the overall frame. And what happens is when you interact with some widget, it invokes a method to tell its parent, hey, my contents have changed and I need to be redrawn. And there's this sort of cascade of, hey, does anything else need to be redrawn and changed as a result of this one state change in this one widget? Um, and then the retained mode will try to compute, you know, how little of the screen do I actually need to update as a consequence of whatever interaction just took place. Immediate mode takes a different approach where you rebuild the entire frame every frame. And you do that uh, by not keeping track of where things are. You don't track where things are positioned. You don't track their size. You don't track their color. You don't track any sort of like styling information at all. You rederive that information every frame. Um, and this sounds insane. This sounds like, why are you wasting colossal resources doing that? But the surprising reality is that doing it the retain mode way is pretty expensive too. Like working through this hierarchy and trying to figure out what has changed as a result of a state change, that is also expensive and hard and easy to screw up. And so doing things in the immediate mode way combined with transparent caching can create similar performance, except you are not like explicitly managing that cache. Like GU does some graphics caching on its own, right? So it sees similar sequence of operations in the operation list. It can reuse work from previous frames. And we intend to do more and more of that. Uh, to become more and more efficient without you, the application programmer, having to do anything else, right? So in GU, we, every frame, recompute where everything is, you know, what color it is, how it's styled, and that makes us very adaptive to change. You resize a GU window, everything's going to resize. Like, nothing's going to get stuck at the wrong size because some you know, internal sizing mechanism failed to get updated correctly. You change the color palette of a GU application, everything just changes colors because everything is like rederiving its color every frame. So it's extremely adaptive to dynamic application state. And we find that that's, that's useful. You mentioned a transparent cache. Could you elaborate on that a bit more? So this is an area that we intend to do more in. But right now, for instance, uh, if you construct a complex path on the screen, like text is a good example. The outline of some text is a very complicated <laughs> clipping region. Ultimately, that gets described in terms of a bunch of vertices and ways of interpolating between them that we call a path. And then we have to send that data to the GPU in order for the GPU to like fill in the contents of that path. So if you reuse a path across multiple frames, we detect that and we don't send it to the GPU more than once. It's going to like stay in residence on the GPU and be reused over there. Similarly, uh, using images, we don't upload them as textures to the GPU again if we did it last frame. 
There's also higher level caching in some of our renderers. Uh, we have a non-default renderer that actually looks for sequences of GUI operations that are exactly the same across frames. Um, and they're allowed to be at different screen offsets. Uh, but if they're exact matches, it will try to bake that region of the interface into a texture. And then on the next frame, instead of recomputing it, if it finds that same sequence of operations again, it will just composite from the texture that it baked the previous frame. So it's skipping GPU side work, but looks the same. So in that situation, it would be sort of like you've, you've got a square on the left, and then the next frame you have a square on the right. Rather than doing all that computation again, it just sort of moves it. Yes, it detects like the same, you know, you clipped a square of this size, you filled it this color. I've seen this before. I'm going to save myself work in the future by baking this into a just an image that we've pre-computed on the GPU. And the next frame I'll pull from that. Okay. And this is something we want to do like more of and explore more ways of doing it. And with all of these the caching and the computing each frame just in time? Would that be accurate? I, I suppose. I'm not sure that it's possible to compute frames ahead of time in the general case, but... With all of these optimization strategies, how performant is Geo compared to some of the other GUI toolkits? I honestly don't know how to measure that fairly. <laughs> like, all I can say is there are applications written in GU that run real smooth. <laughs> in particular, there's a Go execution trace viewer called Go Trace UI by uh, Dominic Conniff, and it runs real nice. Um, <laughs> and it lets you explore the internals of the Go runtime for your applications. It's very useful. But in terms of like, how does it compare to say Flutter or GTK or something like that? I don't have numbers because I'm not certain how to do like a apples to apples comparison. I can say, I don't think GU is as efficient as it can be. Like, I don't think we've reached the limit there. And we're looking at using a new low level render backend by, uh, Raph Levian that does like truly spectacular two-dimensional path or vector rendering and could result in 100x or more, you know, kind of speed up. So the future is bright. So from the end user's perspective, it's performant enough. They won't notice any kind of lagging. It's performant enough for many things, right? But mm -hmm. it depends on what you're trying to, like, it's always going to depend on what you're trying to build. Right. right. And, and what your particular application requirements are and which elements of GU you are in particular stressing in your use case. Which kind of use cases you think would be very well suited for and which other suit cases do you think it would be maybe less suited for? So a number of good GU applications are like chat clients, contexts where you're displaying content that is primarily vector anyway, right? You're drawing outlines of chat bubbles and text and things like that. And you might have the occasional image, but or maybe even lots of images, but it's not like your entire screen is images. Where I think you run into like more friction is uh, if you want to do something like play a video. Uh, right now, we don't natively do that in GU. So your choices are to do like an expensive CPU decoding in order to play it in GU. That's possible, um, but it's it's less efficient than like using a platform decoder. And we don't have a great API for allowing you to work in tandem with the platform. That's coming. Like that's a thing we think we know how to do and we intend to do. But you know, like high multimedia application right now, I think that would be a challenge. Off the top of my head, that's like the biggest area that I think like right now we're not well suited to. So let's uh, maybe have a look at the um, platforms that it runs on. So this is obviously we are the Linux podcast. So the most important platform does it need any dependency? 
if you want to both develop and just run a GUI up from a single binary that you compiled or somebody give you compiled, do you need something like SDL or uh, I don't know any kind of uh, dependencies, or is just having maybe Wayland or X or enough? Uh, in the general case, just having like the normal system graphics libraries that Wayland and X require is sufficient. We do use them. But if you're compiling GUI, it depends on your Linux distribution. You may need to install the header files. Like if you're on a Debian-derived distro or a Fedora distro, you need the dev or devl packages for those. But if you have a pre-compiled GUI application, it ought to just be able to work with your system graphics libraries if you have a graphical system installed. It needs EGL in order to acquire a open geographics context, and it needs like Mesa or you know and or your uh, hardware specific graphics vendor uh, OpenGL implementation or your Vulkan implementation. And you mentioned a very very f- uh, cross platform. Mm-hmm. Let's say that you want to you want to obviously have an application that you run on Linux, but you also want to have it available on. Um, let's say you are making a chat client and you want to make a chat client that can run on any platform. So obviously for uh, the desktop operating systems, I'd imagine it would be just very much same as on Linux. So it, it doesn't matter if it's BSD or Windows, you just compile it and as you know, it should run. What about the mobile, like Android and iOS? Is that uh, a fairly similar story or does it get really involved at those places? Well, the build process is a little bit more involved. Um, as you would imagine, like... Those are not single binary platforms. Uh, There's all this kind of packaging and metadata that needs to go around your binary in order for it to function on those systems. That being said, we provide a CLI called GoGeo that does it for you. So you can say GoGeo, Target, Android, use some other flags to provide things like your app ID and, you know, the the icon you want to use, the name that you want to use, like the human application name, that sort of thing. And it will build your binary and then wrap it in the APK or AAB format metadata necessary. Um, And we have a similar, the same tool can do the same logical thing on iOS. So I did have a a project, I don't work on it so much anymore, but it was a chat client that uh, you could run the same code base on every desktop platform and both mobile platforms. And it was just like minor differences in how we invoked this GoGeo CLI to build for different ones. That is an interesting thing. Uh, GeoGeo can also be used for the web. So that's a WebAssembly compilation. How does that work? So the Go compiler actually supports compiling to WebAssembly. It's a sort of a beta feature but it's in there and there's a special package called syscall.js that lets you reach out to the JavaScript runtime environments and invoke JavaScript functions. Um, And so we can use that to do everything Gyo needs to do. So is there like an organization around Gyo or how is Gyo governed essentially? Gyo has two maintainers, Ilias who started the project and me. I'm mostly responsible for Gyo's text display uh, support and high-level widget APIs, and then a bunch of sort of extensions to GUI that live in a a separate repository. But the governance right now is just kind of the two of us trying to do the best we can with feedback from the community. Mm, So it's pretty informal, like there's no entity of any kind? No, we do have, like, you can donate financially to GUI. You know, we have an open collective and you can sponsor the GitHub organization or Alias and I individually. And we use that money to fund development time. Uh, a lot of GIO's big features are sponsored by companies using GIO, uh, but the community can provide funds as well to let us take on important maintainership things. Do you, uh, do you or anyone else work on GIO full time? I arguably do. I work primarily for a client Plato team that uh, makes a mobile social gaming platform and they're working on a desktop application that is built on top of GIA. So my full-time gig is either working uh, upstream in GIA, adding things that they need for their application or integrating that sort of thing into their application. Is there a lot of uh, other contributors, people who might not do this uh, very often, but who contribute uh, when you you need something fixed? Does GIO 
uh, have uh, a lot of other contributors or is it basically just you two? I would say we have a, a healthy contributor base. I think we have changes from 10 to 15 people every month. It varies some, but uh, you can always read through like our, our newsletters and we always credit people individually for their contributions and there's always a decent list. The actual repositories, if I'm not mistaken, they are stored on Source Hut, aren't they? That is correct. So can you talk about that? It's not unknown, but it's, uh, you know, usually when you say Project X has uh, is open source and has a repo, usually that's a GitHub repo, less often GitLab. Why did you guys choose uh, Source Hut? Well, um, I believe Elias originally chose Source Hut because it supports email-based collaboration as a first-class feature. And email is a meaningfully decentralized system in that you, you can contribute to GIU via email without a source set account, without signing up for anything. It, it lowers the barrier to entry on kind of a technical level. But at the same time, yeah, it's, it's obscure, right? Relatively few people use source set. So we also provide a GitHub mirror and we accept contributions in the form of GitHub pull requests for people uninterested in doing the email workflow. That's quite refreshing to hear. Um, I know it It certainly sounds like something that might be maybe awkward for some people who are used to uh, tools that are a little bit more easy to, to manage nowadays. But yeah, like email is probably, I think, in my opinion, probably one of the last holdouts in terms of like democratized technology. I, I think there's not really anything else that comes close to email in terms of ubiquity and in that it's a technology that nobody really owns. I could be talking out my ass there, but <laughs> I think I think that's true. Has email-based collaboration been a significant barrier for a significant number of potential contributors? I would say yes. There are quite a few people who it was difficult to get email-based stuff to like work on their system or it works it doesn't work as well. Like I think Windows support for Git send email is notoriously mediocre. Uh, I don't think it handles like UTF-8 correctly and other things, but that's why we, you know, invested in having GitHub infrastructure. There are still plenty of people who do use the email fly. I still think the majority of contributions are coming from our mailing list, people sending patches, but I'm not going to say that it hasn't been like an obstacle for people. It really has. Are there any other kind of um, difficulties or what difficulties there are in uh, for GIU, except for fighting with technology or trying to, you know, uh, trying to uh, make graphics cards do what you want them to do? I would say that the biggest challenge is the scope of the work and the, the number of hands to do it, right? We do have, I think, a healthy community, but um, GIU competes in the same space with, say, Flutter, right? And we're not Google. So when you look at the the resources that we can bring to bear on the problem, we have to be tactical about how we spend our time and energy. Um, and you know we're aware of things like we could have better documentation, no doubt. There's there's a lot that could be done there, but we also have to choose, right? We have a very small number of maintainers, and we have to choose between things like writing comprehensive documentation and fixing bugs and uh, improving performance and, and lots of other things. And so we're, we're doing what we can with what we have. I'm curious, actually, because you mentioned, uh, you said, like, we're not Google, and you know, you have Flutter and things like that. Um, one thing I've always found quite fascinating in the open source community is that you can have projects that are not backed by major corporations, um, are very small scale operations but can be just as innovative and ingenious as the projects that are created by major corporations and just as utilized by people in creating things. So I don't really have a direct question, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on, on why that is, you know? I think that selection pressure works in this space. GIU only continues to exist because the ideas that power it and the implementation are fundamentally interesting to people, right? There's no marketing budget for GIU. <laughs> We're not out there spraying our name at people. We have no developer advocates or evangelist squad or whatever, right? 
the fact that people are here is because we offer something that's technically compelling. And so in, in the open source world, when you can, you know, get something far enough that it is compelling, uh, and, and brings people on board, you can kind of snowball a community that can create really incredible stuff in spite of the resource constraints. What are some of the most difficult technical hurdles you've had to overcome? Like I know Geo supports right to left text rendering and color emojis came recently and all of that stuff is really complicated. What are some of the most difficult things? Yeah. Well, one of my first projects when I uh, started doing this sort of work, Plato wanted to be able to display right to left text. And up until then, Giyu had been using a, uh, a text shaper, which is a program that you give it string data and a font, and it figures out which symbols within the font should be used to represent that string. It had been using one that uh, kind of made some naive assumptions that only really work for European languages. And so there's this, there's this gigantic C++ code base called HarfBuzz that is used by like Google Chrome and many other, you know, GTK, like everybody in sort of the C, C++ world relies on HarfBuzz to do their text shaping because it handles really complex stuff. Other languages, Arabic and Thai and Korean, which have very complicated writing systems where many Unicode code points might combine to form one visual symbol or might uh, a single code point might become multiple symbols, or like three code points might become five symbols. You know, like the, the relationship is not intuitive. And that was kind of a big hurdle for Giyu because we, we don't want a lot of native dependencies. We don't want to require you to have libraries you don't already have. Uh, we want to be uh, as much as possible written in Go so that it's easy to compile things uh, for all these different platforms. And so we weren't sure how to resolve that. Until Benoit Kugler, a open source Go contributor uh, in France somewhere, ported HarfBuzz to Go on his own, unsolicited. And we just like found out he did that and then started engaging with him to figure out like how we could collaborate and build a Go, like a pure Go text shaping stack. Because shaping is only part of it. You got a line wrap and a lot of other kind of fiddly details. Um, and so I spent several months wrapping my head around the, the mapping from, okay, I start with a string and I end up with a bunch of font glyphs that I need to display. And uh, how do I do this? And how do I wrap lines when the lines could be going left to right or right to left? And then later on, we now support bi-directional text where you can have a left to right paragraph with right to left text inside of it. And there's a lot of nuance and complexity that arises there. And I would have to say like, that's the hardest thing that I've personally been contending with is making sure that you can handle that sort of use case. From what I've heard, text rendering in general is one of the most difficult things to implement from scratch. It feels that way. <laughs> so how did you get involved with Geo? How did you find it and decide you wanted to start contributing? Uh, so Elias gave a talk at GopherCon, which is like the big Go programming language convention in 2019. And he was a keynote speaker demonstrating Geo. Uh, on the big stage. And I saw a recording of that in like November 2019. And I said, oh, that's cool. You know, I like, I write lots of Go. I like Go, but it'd be interesting to make GUIs. And so I played with Gia for like, I don't know, a week. I made something small and nifty and then I kind of left it alone. But uh, like a splinter in my mind, I was never able to forget about it. Like I was like, you know, now I can build, I can build GUIs. And so months later, I had this chat project that I was working on and I wanted a GUI for it. I had been building a terminal user interface and I circled back to Giyu and I was like, you know, I bet I could do it. I bet I could build it with this. And so I did that and I got like really far, but every once in a while I'd run into like, well, I need a widget that does this thing and that doesn't exist yet. So I'd have to build it. And then I was like, well, I might as well kind of package this up so other people can use it too. And that happened quite a few times to the point where I had like this big repository of like extra widgets 
for people to use in GU. And um, at some point, GU was having, you know, like monthly meetups and we would talk and people were, were using my stuff. And at some point, Elias offered to make that like extra repository of stuff I'd built kind of like an official part of the project. And I was, you know, excited to accept that and help out. And then as time has progressed, I'm now, you know, I've rewritten most of Q's text rendering stack or text shaping, at least, uh, stack um, and certain other parts as well. So I've just kind of sunk into the project and worked on more and more of it. And what kind of development setup do you have for all of this work? I would say it's pretty boring. Uh, I mostly work out of a terminal emulator. I use the Cocoon editor, uh, which is a, an editor similar to Vim, I suppose. And I, you know, I, I take advantage of stuff like language server protocol. So I have like some intelligence in there, but, uh, yeah, just like, uh, Alacrity and Tmux and Cocoon are sufficient for me right now. So those imply a Linux distribution. Which one have you, have you settled on for now at least? This is bait. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because you know the answer. So uh, I am currently running Arch. Don't say it. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. I was thinking you were still on Pop OS. No, I've left Debian based distros behind because I can't stand the how out of date all the packages are all the time. That's part of why I like running Arch as well. My money actually was on Nixos, but I don't know why. I'm inexorably being drawn to NixOS. Like, it's a singularity, and I'm slowly slipping toward the event horizon, but um, <laughs> I haven't fallen through it yet. I've, I've actually got it installed on a spare SSD, and I periodically shove it in my laptop and, and mess around with it. I haven't gone that direction yet, but I would like to, because the promise of declaring your entire operating system configuration in a couple of text files is really compelling. As soon as they stabilize on how to actually do it. Uh, yeah. So I think that's a good place to wrap things up. Chris, thanks uh, a million for coming on the show. Um, it was a really fascinating discussion, actually. I really enjoyed it. If you want people to find the project or to find you, where should they go? Uh, you can find the project at geoui.org. It's G-I-O-U-I dot org. And I guess you can find me on GitHub or SourceHut as Where's Walden. That's W H E R E S W A L D O N. It's a Where's Waldo pun because my last name is Waldo <laughs> with an N on the end of it. <laughs> we'll have links in the show notes as well. I am not on any social platform, so you can't find me there. If you want to talk to me, you can find me in the Gophers Slack instance the like go programming language one in the goui channel but that's about it i really enjoy when i meet people who have basically no socials that's just really nice to hear sometimes <laughs> so that's been it for this fortnight i was about to say week but um fortnight again thank you to chris for coming on check out the go project uh, mike and amalith have been raving about it for quite some time and i haven't tried it yet but i will so as usual, our socials, um, if you want to get to any of those, just go linuxlads.com slash name of the thing. So slash Twitter, slash Mastodon, slash Discord, etc. Pick a platform, put a slash, put the name of the platform at the end of linuxlads.com and you'll probably get to it. So I think that covers everything. Thank you for listening and we will see you again in two weeks. So say goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Chris. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye.